Our next speaker is Brian Balo, partner at Dixon Wright. Brian Balo is a member of the law firm Dixon Wright, where he concentrated his practices in the area of information technology, intellectual property, and healthcare law. Um, Brian has served for five years as a practice, practice director of Dixon Wright Information Technology and Security and Electrical, electrical Intellectual Property and Telecommunications Practice Department. So, welcome. All right, thanks, Brian. Thanks, uh, thanks for being here, and I'll try not to ruin your appetites. We talk about laws and regulations. Uh, my dad was a radiologist, and uh, I worked in his practice back in the 1970s at Grace Northwest Hospital in Detroit. And I think about that because I think about when we talk about privacy and data security, how it did not exist back then. We had films in envelopes with patients' names, dates of birth, probably the social security number written on the front of the envelope, and they were stored in the basement of an abandoned movie theater on the front of the premises. And that was it. That was the data security back then for medical records. The second thing I think about is, at the end of each day, in the morning my dad would do his examinations, and he'd go in his office at the, at the hospital and he'd dictate. And then that, the dictation would go to a stenographer who would create a report, and there were exactly as many copies of that report as they, there were necessary to give to the treating physicians, and that was it. So there was one for the radiologist, one for the treating physician, and that was it, which in stark contrast to what we're dealing with today, everything's digital. You know, the, the films are digitized images now. The medical records with the you know, the, from the mid-2000s to now with all the incentives and all the disincentives to not adopting electronic health records, the possibility for creating millions and millions of copies of a record are at the flip of a switch, basically. So, so that's why we're here today, at least that's why I'm here today, is just to give a survey of the laws and the regulations that apply to HIT, Health Information Technology. So I'm going to buzz through these. I know we're on a compressed time frame because the schedule got a little long this morning. So I'll go ahead and do that and let's, I'll try to save a little bit of time at the end for questions. So if you could hold them while we go through it, then we'll see if we have that time. So there's really three themes that I look at. Privacy, which addresses whose information is protected, what information is protected, when it is protected, and to some degree why it's protected. Security addresses how the private information must be protected. And then safety addresses the integrity of that information and the interoperability of systems that exchange that information. So these are the three themes that underpin these laws and regulations. So about that information, whose information are we talking about? We're really talking about consumers at the end of the day, patients, buyers, buyers of health services, Clients, if you're in an SUD environment, they're, I guess, termed clients. Uh, what information are we talking about? Personally identifiable information. Protected health information under HIPAA is a subset of that, but it's still personally identifiable inf information. So names, addresses, social security numbers, driver's license numbers, any kind of information that can be taken to identify a particular individual. And when, when is it protected? It's, it's protected from disclosure without authorization or consent. And that authorization or consent, I mean, we're talking about permission effectively. When that authorization or consent is not existing, then there are laws and regulations that protect against that disclosure. That can be either express consent, in the case of SUD information under, under 42 part two, you need a, a written consent, for example, or it can be statutorily authorized consent. That's the HIPAA use, you know, exchange of protected health information for the approved purposes, right? So it's authorized. So about that security, we talked about the, the information. Now what about that security? Under HIPAA, which I think is a very good, just sort of basic area to, to talk about all these issues, under HIPAA, the adopted security measures, which are defined under HIPAA as administrative, physical, and technical safeguards. This is a very technically oriented conference, as it should be. 
But keep in mind that when they talk about safeguards that need to be in place, it's not just technical. And I could editorialize all day today about the fact that, you know, I think there's maybe too heavy of a reliance on technical fixes when a lot of the issues that are faced today in unauthorized disclosure really are more administrative. Um, but that's, that's a topic for another day. So about the security, what are those measures, what are they in, required to do? They have to ensure that the, the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of all the electronic PHI they create, receive, maintain, transmit. They have to identify and protect against reasonably anticipated threats to the security of the integrity of that, the information, protect against reasonably anticipated impermissible uses or disclosures, and ensure compliance by the workforce. I was going to type that twice at the end, ensure compliance by the workforce, because in my experience and in my practice, that's where I see probably the largest gap of any, is the compliance by the workforce. So the other thing to keep in mind when, when you read through these is HIPAA and, and the other laws and regulations, they recognize that one size doesn't fit all. They recognize that every environment is different and they provide the latitude for that. So keep that in mind as you're dealing with these issues in your environment. So in case you didn't think Big Brother was watching, um, I put this slide up. And this is really the federal role. It says in mobile health, but really is in health information technology, technology in general. So in the upper right-hand corner, starting up there and going clockwise, we have the F FCC, Federal Communications Commission. We have SAMHSA, which deals with substance use disorder information. We have the FDA. I spoke in an earlier slide about safety-related issues. That's where the FDA comes in, and it does relate to information. Uh, we have healthit.gov, which is really ONC, the Office of the National Coordinator. The next shield there is the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, next to that, the Office of Civil Rights under HHS. This is the enforcement arm for HIPAA. And then we have NIST, and NIST has an involvement in developing standards. There's already been some discussion this morning about NIST's role. Um, I will say quickly that NIST does, well, I'm going to get to this in a minute, so I'll wait. So, federal government, the federal key federal laws and regulations related to data security and privacy, the Federal Trade Commission Act, Section 5, and I'll speak in more detail, FDASIA, which is the FDA's uh, regulation as it relates to medical devices, HIPAA, and then 42 CFR Part 2, which is actually a regulation for substance use disorder information that was promulgated under the Public Health Service Act. So those are the key federal laws and regulations. So the FTC really works for consumers. If you, if you want to think about the FTC and its jurisdiction, think consumers. Works for consumers to prevent fraudulent, deceptive, unfair business practices. These claims are usually tied now these days to privacy policy violations in IT space. The last speaker referenced, or maybe two speakers ago, reference the po privacy policies at the bottom of website pages that you link to. FTC really keeps an eye on those. And really, uh, it doesn't affect covered entities, business associates, so much as it protects uh, the vendors of personal health records and, and people who are operating in that space. People who other, or otherwise are not captured under the HIPAA requirements. FTC does take a look at those vendors and they will have a privacy policy, terms of use, something like that in there when you sign up with them that discloses to you what they're going to do with the information that they acquire from you. If they violate that, then the FTC can step in under its jurisdiction and take action. So they also enforce the health breach notification rule. You may not have known one of those existed. That's an FTC breach notification rule, and again, that really pertains to personal health record vendors for the most part in the healthcare space. Okay? Uh, the FCC, I'm, I'm not really going to get into this because it deals really primarily with mobile health issues, but understand that they are involved and active in that area. So if you are in that area, understand that the FCC does have some involvement there. The FDA, 
They have public health responsibility to oversee the safety and effectiveness of a small set of mobile medical applications. This has become a big issue in the last year or so, probably 18 months. Um, there are more and more vendors of mobile medical apps. Uh, there's questions about the safety of those apps, how they're used, those kinds of things. So the FDA has weighed in. They did uh, publish guidance in February of this year talking about where they're going to exercise their enforcement discretion. That's a, an FDA term, kind of a funny term, but basically outlining and giving guidance. Understand FDA guidance is not binding, and it says it on the front of every guidance publication that they publish, but they have be, been fairly clear in their guidance that they're going to take sort of a light hand in the mobile medical app uh, area and really just key on those apps that, that really convert like an iPhone into a true medical device, something that could directly impact the safety of the patient that's using that device. Um, additionally, they've examined safety issues associated with medical device data systems, which is hardware or software that products that transfer, store, convert formats and display medical device data. Again, initially the FDA classified MDDS as a class three device, which is the most stringent classification under the M FDA. Then they reclassified to a class one device, which is really, you know, you're on your own to decide how much you need to do pre-market notification, those kinds of things. Then they issued guidance as well in February of this year, effect effectively saying they're not, gonna, they're not gonna exercise any of their enforcement authority with MDDS, okay? So that's you know, information that's being transmitted between devices, that kind of thing, medical imaging. That. Uh, NIST, we talked about NIST. The, the one thing I was gonna comment on, when we get to the issue of encryption under HIPAA, um, if you are not encrypting your protected health information, shame on you. It's a very easy thing to do, and in fact, the HIPAA regulations point to NIST 800 standards about how you would go about doing that. There are plenty of vendors out there who can help you in that regard. When we talk about Anthem in a few slides, you'll understand why encryption is so important. Uh, 42 CFR Part 2, this has been a big issue in the state of Michigan in the standard consent project. Recently, under 42 Part 2, it covers, again, substance use disorder information. Uh, it applies to programs, and programs are basically, um, you know, alcohol and, and drug abuse uh, clinics, that kind of thing. They have to have federal funding to fall under that regulation, but if they do and they are a program, then those SUD patient records may disclo be disclosed or used only as permitted in these regulations. Regulations go on to say that basically you cannot disclose that information unless you have written consent. And that written consent has to be very specific in terms of who can disclose, who can receive. Um, generally, if you don't have that express written consent, unless it's a medical emergency, there are certain research activities and certain audit or evaluation activities, that information may not be disclosed. Uh, finally, we get to OCR. I left this one to last because this is the one that's you know on, on top of mind for everyone, and, and it should be because this is the area where we're seeing the enforcement activity. It's the area where, where we are seeing the violations. Um, until I really got involved in this area, I've been in information technology law for 20 some years, but I really got involved in health information technology about 2008. I think that's when I met Helen the first time at the uh, Minneapolis conference up uh, for, for HIMSS. Um, but it became clear because there was such a push for the electronic health records that it was gonna be an area that was gonna get a lot of attention. And some of you here may know that prior to 2008 and prior to that real push for the adoption of EHR, HIPAA was a sleepy wasteland. I mean, there was nothing going on under HIPAA. It was, it was enacted in 1996, but as far as OCR enforcement, they really, and you can go on their website and take a look at their enforcement activity over the years, they really weren't doing anything, but it makes sense because there weren't nearly the level of electronic health records prior to that time. So violations were paper documents. They were, I had a client recently who um, had someone actually physically 
running paper records in a car from one facility to another on a summer day with the window open and the, and the papers blew out the window. All right, that's, that's potentially a HIPAA violation, all right? Um, so that was the kind of thing that, that went on before we had all the electronic health records. But since 2008, OCR has become very active, as many of you may know. And it's not just, and I, I can also tell you that, although I don't represent individuals who think they have had HIPAA violations, I get at least one to two emails into my inbox every day from somebody telling me they think they've had their HIPAA rights violated. That's every day, one to two. And they find my name on the internet, and that's how they, they email me. So if they're doing that with me, it gives you an idea as to what's really going on out there. Um, so the privacy rule, so OCR is responsible for implementing and enforcing the privacy, security, and breach notification rules, all right? Privacy rule provides individuals with specific rights with respect to their PHI when it's maintained by a health plan, health care provider, um, so covered entities, you probably know that by now. Security rule requires covered entities and business associates, which was a big deal in the final rule that came out two years ago, right? They, they made it pretty clear, they made it abundantly clear that business associates are now responsible under the security rule to maintain reasonable and appropriate administrative, technical, and physical safeguards. There are also state laws and industry standards that you should be aware of. The state laws, various state statutes addressing protection of healthcare information, AIDS, HIV information, mental health information, Social Security numbers, driver's license information, and breach notification laws. 47 states now have data, or not yet, breach notification laws. So if there's an incident, not only do you have to be aware of whether you are covered under HIPAA as a covered entity, business associate, but you need to understand what implication there is to you under a state data breach notification law. The last time I had to deal with this, the client had individuals in 36 different states who were affected, so we had to go to each one of those statutes and determine what we needed to do in terms of doing notification. Now, there are common law theories, negligence, breach of contract, etc. Anytime there's a lot of money potentially involved, there's a very creative plaintiff's bar out there. Plaintiff's attorneys can find ways to get around things like the fact that under HIPAA there is no private right of action. So if your HIPAA rights were violated, you cannot go and sue the health system or whatever under HIPAA. You don't have that right. So the plaintiff's lawyers have seen an opportunity, and I'm not saying they're wrong for doing this, but they've seen an opportunity to claim negligence, breach of contract, other creative theories to try to gain recovery for affected individuals. Um, licensure requirements is a big topic in the telemedicine area right now and has been again for a number of years. There is a, an attempt to get an interstate compact dealing with this. Telemedicine is an important part of health information technology. Obviously it helps you know, doctors communicate across state lines. If I'm in Florida and I get hurt or sick and I've got someone treating me down there and they want to talk to my physician up here via telemedicine, that's a very good thing. However, some states, maybe not all, but some states are very provincial about their licensing requirements and would view that as a no-no and might say that Doc in Michigan is now practicing medicine in Florida, not licensed to do so, that's a problem. So this is another issue, sort of a hot button issue right now. The last item is an industry standard PCI DSS. Some of you may know about that. That's payment card industry data security standards. So if you're a healthcare provider and you're accepting credit card payments, you need to know what your responsibilities for security, data security are under PCI DSS. It's not a law, it's a contractual obligation. If you breach it, then you get thrown to the mercy of Visa, MasterCard, and American Express and Discover. Michigan has um, couple of statutes that are worth knowing about on confidentiality, mental health records under the Michigan uh, Mental Health Code and serious communicable diseases records under the Michigan Public Health Code. I'm not going to read that in the interest of time, but you should be aware of these statutes in Michigan. So who are the enforcement bodies? The Office of Civil Rights enforces HIPAA. 
breach notification requirements, fines, and audits. That's the other thing that I wanted to mention is the, the audit program. Um, they have been, I don't know, for some reason not, they were supposed to announce the audit program for 2015 before the end of 2014. Last I checked, they still haven't. And there's been a lot of back and forth about and murmurings about what they were going to do. They are statut statutorily required to do these audits. And so I'm not sure what's going on within the agency, but at some point they're going to come. So if you are subject to HIPAA, um, if you haven't already made sure that you're compliant and you've got your policies and procedures and your risk assessments done and everything, I wouldn't wait. Um, the U.S. Attorney enforces 42 Part 2. There are criminal sanctions for a violation of 42 Part 2. That's the SUD. Uh, the FDA has enforcement authority over the things we talked about earlier. The Federal Trade Commission, privacy policy violations, health breach notification rule. FTC, not unlike the ONC, is not at all shy about levying fines. Uh, they've levied some heavy fines over the years, not necessarily in the healthcare industry, but certainly in, in a lot of other, you know, the retail industries. You read about Target and TJ Maxx a few years ago. So the FTC is pretty, pretty aggressive in their enforcement activity. The state AGs, uh, attorneys general, they have authority to enforce HIPAA. Uh, which is important to know as well, as well as state privacy laws, and then we talked about the class action lawyers. Why we care, in addition to an ethical commitment to privacy, why do we care? Um, so total investigated resolutions, this is under HIPAA, the OCR, they are active. I mean, that's a lot. Total complaints investigated, 33,880. So they are, you know, they're doing their job. Um, so they are very active. Why we care, part two, financial consequences of anthems. Anybody know about anthem in here, heard about anthem? All right, 80 million records, right? Could reach beyond the $100 million mark according to reports, 80 million current customers, okay. So that's just the breach notification part of it. So you figure they gotta notify 80 million people you figure a dollar a record, and they're not going to do it for a dollar a record probably, right? So $100 million is probably a conservative estimate. That has nothing to do with any fines that are going to come down from HIPAA. It has nothing to do with any resolution of the myriad class action lawsuits that have already been filed against Anthem. So this is a big, big, big ticket item. Now, encryption. Anybody know why? They have to notify 80 million people. Any guesses? They did not encrypt. So somebody's probably in trouble at Anthem. I'm just guessing. Um, had they encrypted, this is huge, right? Had they encrypted, they would not have to follow the breach notification procedures. So if you take one thing away from what I'm talking about here today, is go back to your organizations if you're subject to HIPAA and ask the right person that question. You know, do we encrypt? I have an entire slide deck that I can, yes sir. Say that again? Exactly, exactly, right. And I was just going to say, I have another slide deck that has, speaks to nothing but encryption, all right, and how you comply. So happy to share that if you want to take a look at it. But all you need to do is read the HIPAA regulations, honestly. I mean, I'm not going to tell you anything here today that's not there front and center. So, um, okay. Secondly, two healthcare organizations agreed to settle charges, uh, monetary payments, $4.8 million. That was last year as well. So, it's a lot of money. Why we care part three, this is about the audit program. That's the statutory provision I was referencing earlier. The secretary shall provide for periodic audits. So, it's not, that, it's not discretionary with OCR. It's not, gee, it might be nice to do these audits. It's the, the law telling them you will do these audits. So, be aware of that. 
Okay, so compliance steps, appoint qualified privacy and security officers, the receptionist in your doctor's office is probably not who you wanna pick to be your privacy and security officer. I've seen that happen. Um, perform risk assessments, that is critical as well. Uh, you have not really become HIPAA compliant if you go on the web and pull down a bunch of policies and procedures and change the names and put them in a drawer. That's not HIPAA compliance. In fact, I think the OCR would view that as an even worse violation than if you didn't have anything. Um, so you have to perform the risk assessment, not only for that purpose, but again, as I said earlier, one size doesn't fit all. So you really need to know your environment and this is how you find it out. Then adopt, implement, enforce, and update appropriate policies and procedures. You have someone violating your, your HIPAA blatantly, they really ought to be, if not warned, or if not terminated, warned, seriously, and warned that if it happens again, terminated. A couple of years ago, I gave a presentation to the National Council of State Boards of Nursing it was a great audience. I mean, these were very, very, but I got to tell you, some of the stories I heard about Facebook postings and, you know, patient information, photographs and things like that, it was amazing. So, um, integrate your HIPAA policies with other related policies. Encrypt, we talked about regular workforce education, train, train, train. Compliance steps two, know the data requiring protection in your environment, right? Where are you subject to, what jurisdiction basically applies to your organization? Encrypt, I said it again, know who is receiving, storing, and transmitting your data. If you're working with cloud service providers, that's a whole other separate issue um, that, you know, is worthy of a different presentation, but if you're doing that, you really need to know your provider. And that means, number one, if you're in a HIPAA environment, um, they are a business associate. They should sign a business associate agreement. You should go in and get yourselves comfortable that they actually are compliant with HIPAA, because they have to be. Um, and also, you should negotiate appropriate risk sharing obligations with them, meaning indemnities, things like that, that say, if it happens on your watch and not our watch, then you're going to cover us for whatever that cost is. Investigate cyber liability insurance options. That's a fluid market. I can't give you any concrete advice on that right now. I've got a slide coming up here, but it's developing. There's not enough experience for the actuaries yet to really decide you know, what the premiums ought to be and what the payouts. It is really fluid right now, but you should investigate it. Um, if you do it, you should carry it yourself if feasible. Um, if you're using a cloud service provider, if they're of any heft, they ought to have their own policy and they ought to name you as an additional insured, all right? Know the coverages and exclusions. See the case at the bottom, that's Columbia Casualty. They made a payout, this is very recent, on behalf of Cottage Health and now they're suing Cottage Health to get their money back, saying you didn't comply with the terms of the policy. How did they not comply with the terms of the policy? They didn't follow their policies and procedures internally to be compliant with HIPAA. So, it's out there, but it's not a panacea. I've heard other speakers say, just get the insurance. It's really not that simple. If a breach occurs, that's supposed to be a cat coming out of a bag up at the top of the slide. Um, don't panic. Seriously, don't panic. Uh, establish an attorney-client privilege. Most healthcare organizations these days have internal counsel. Bring it to the counsel's desk right away. If you're smaller and you have outside counsel, get it to your outside counsel. Minimize email, texting, et cetera, regarding the breach. I always tell my clients, it's okay to put decisions in writing. It's not okay to put deliberations in writing because if there's not an attorney-client privilege, all that stuff is discoverable. It's fair game. There's no such thing as internal confidentiality. Uh, preserve your evidence. There's a thing called spoliation of evidence that you don't want to get involved with. You'll get in big trouble with the judge and the court. 
Uh, that means just keep it. Don't destroy stuff if you've had a breach. Um, I will quickly say, when I worked in-house at a company, and I won't name the company, um, we had a lawsuit, and the CEO came into my office one day, and he had a big folder of papers in it. And, and it was an important lawsuit, and he put it on my desk, and he said, I assume you'll destroy all these, right? And it was like, can't, sorry, can't do that, so. Um, Okay, apply or do your risk analysis if you have a breach. There's a HIPAA model for risk analysis that I think is good in, in just about any of these breach-related situations. Apply the findings against the applicable laws and regulations. Know your facts and then see where you fit within your obligations for breach notification. If you do fit within them, notify your insurance carrier. Even if you don't have cyber liability insurance, I would, you might want to notify your general liability insurer. You never know. You might have some coverage in there. And then check your indemnity rights. Again, if you're using a third party to store any of your data, you want to check to see if you have any rights vis-a-vis -vis them. So my final thoughts, um, in terms of the audit issue, audit preparedness, you can go to that link there, and it gives you the audit protocol. So it tells you what they're going to look for. And it's very good information from, from the other side in terms of how you ought to have your own compliance in order. Uh, encryption again, and then as I kind of let off with, this whole idea of privacy and data security, in my view and in my experience, is really an institutional and cultural and not a technical issue. I think that there are too many organizations that are guilty of the pointing to the IT department and saying they'll fix it. Right, We're in a law firm, I'm in a law firm, a pretty big law firm. I'm very good friends with our CIO and we talk all the time about this stuff because we're not dealing with PHI, but we're dealing with client information which has many of the same issues with it. And we talk a lot about the cultural issues. And what that means is attorneys locking doors, locking file cabinets, not leaving their laptops on the, in the airport, those kinds of things, and not allowing data to reside locally on the laptops, uh, secured environments. But it is really an institutional and cultural issue, not a technical issue. And here's my disclaimer that this is, none of this was legal advice, but and contact information. So I don't know if we have time for questions or... Okay. Any questions? No? Sure. Yes, sir? There you go. When I um, proposed this working group called Auto, we thought about using the slug as a logo because logo, we're like, this, this, it's so hard to get companies to work together. It's this slow. So um, do you have any advice for um, how to enable companies or to share information or to work together in this area? For example, um, if a breach occurs. I'm not sure I understand the choir. Are you saying if, a, if you have a breach, how, oh, getting them to work together, yeah. Um, well, the, the, the problem that you're often going to face is um, who's going to accept the, the ultimate liability for that. That's the problem that you face in that environment. If, if, there are, if there's more than one actor potentially touching the data that was disclosed, they're going to circle the wagons in their respective organizations. And, and it's just a natural reaction to say, you know, we don't, we're not going to be sharing any, any information with anyone until we know exactly what our position is, okay? Um, if you're talking about, you know, lessons learned, then, yeah, maybe there's an opportunity for a lessons learned kind of a, kind of a scenario. And it wouldn't, there, there wouldn't be anything to impede healthcare organizations from deciding that, you know, it would be a really good idea if we had a work group among our various people who are responding, you know, security officers, privacy officers, to sit down and talk about best practices, right? 
I mean, there shouldn't be anything to prevent that from happening. I don't know if that answers your question. Any other questions? Nope. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.